one of the things I've been thinking about and we've been talking with, with Christian about is why, why should we study animal groups? You know, why is there an increasing interest in this particular area of research? And I think that um, there's a fundamental problem in biological systems, which is that you know, if we want to understand functional complexity at a microscopic scale, such as the functioning of the tissue, for example, we must understand how the actions and interactions of the components, could be cells and so on, function. Now, the advantage of using animal groups is that they frequently exhibit complex and coordinated collective behaviours. So we can go out in the natural world and find very interesting patterns uh, that, that can teach us something about how this kind of works. And what's also important is that they can be observable and also manipulated, but there's very, very little attempt at actually doing so. Um, and so we, I think we do have great potential to develop and test mathematical models that link these levels of scale using animal groups. We're very, very far from, from achieving that. Uh, and also, I mean, Christian had a very, uh, an excellent introduction. Um, and, you know, there, there are other reasons why we should be interested in this. There are biologically inspired solutions for grouping vehicles, uh, optimization algorithms and so on. Um, but we're also beginning to realize that the types of uh, swarming behaviours that we see in the natural world and that we're beginning to model and understand <coughs> are actually exhibited in a wide range of systems from the immune system, bacterial infection and even very recently in tumour proliferation. Uh, also, if we want to understand disease transmission in animal populations we need to understand how animals interact with each other and how they interact with the external environment and this is increasingly important to conservation issues where the impact of human-generated environmental modification is having big impacts on migration patterns of ungulates, fish, and so on. Uh, so there's been <coughs> recent development of many conceptually similar models. Uh, most of these models are zone-based. You know, there's some sort of interaction range in which you interact with other particles. Particles tend to move at constant speeds, and people are interested in how you uh, tend to align these sort of coupled oscillators. Uh, but there are very, very few experimental studies that attempt to actual model validation. So in some sense, you know, as a modeler who's interested in the biological systems, I get a little bit disillusioned with continuing to do models, because you can more or less make a model do anything you want it to do, but we don't really know whether it relates to reality. And it's quite scary, actually, that we have all these zone-based models, but there is, uh, as far as I'm aware, no very good evidence that that's actually what any organisms actually do. And part of the problem is that there are great difficulties in quantifying the motion of many organisms concurrently. It's very easy in our simulation model to create these particles and have thousands of them running around interacting with each other. But when we deal with reality, you know, how can we understand this? So one way that we're beginning to, to address this, this topic is by developing computer vision techniques. These are locusts, hoppers in the, in the, uh, the lab in Oxford, being filmed from above. And here's some software I've written that can track the motion of all the individuals simultaneously, recording the angles that they're moving at, their distance to nearest neighbours, who they're interacting with, and so on. So we can begin to get some, some details and interactions. And that's really going to be a theme here, is how we can use this type of technology to begin to understand better how animal groups move. We've also been using very similar technology to analyse the motion of human crowds. This is Corn Market Street in Oxford that we've been filming from above. And we've been interested in how people interact with obstacles, for example. So this is the density of pedestrians. These flow vectors are measured from, from real crowds. And we're also interested in where the individuals are looking. So this is giving us an indication of the angle at which individuals tend to look. Um, I'm not going to go into any further details, but we can really go from, from the scale of looking at how cells interact to how much larger communities interact. Um, I started my sort of interest in, in animal grouping and tracking motion looking at ants. These, again, are real ants each color-coded with little identities, um, and it was an absolute nightmare to get these types of data. Um, I had to paint the ants um, with, with, with a, a hair, and you dip it in paint and you paint the ants, and then I printed out tiny little labels, this is Ant HM, uh, and then I had a second camera which recorded the ants coming out of the nest and which individual was which. Um, I will never do this type of research again, but I would encourage other people to do so. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I, I was interested in this particular case. You know, there's a lot of interest in collective robotics. How do you explore space? Well, one way we can get an indication of how to explore space is to look at how a natural system, these ant colonies, are constantly exploring new environments. And so I, I, there's a nest over here, there's a little bridge, and the ants wander around this arena here and I can track the motion of all the individuals simultaneously. The red dots represent where the ants currently are, and these green lines represent the trajectories. And we can begin to ask questions about, well, how simple are these, these agents? How simple are these ants? Are they doing anything at all that's clever? Um, they tend to enter the arena at a fairly <coughs> constant rate. 
and they tend to maintain a constant number of ants within the, within the arena. There was, um, but what they, what they will also do is over time, this is the mean angular deviation, which decreases, which shows that the ants will actually have more linear trajectories over time. So when they first search a space, they have this very sort of convoluted walk. They really want to explore every part of that area collectively. But once they get used to the area, probably through pheromone deposition, they know they're more familiar with it, and they'll tend to move more linearly. So that the network of the ant exploration actually changes adaptively through time. Um, there was previous uh, theory that, that predicted, or that argued, that what the ants would also do was as density increased, the optimal strategy should be to have a more tortuous trajectory. And there was one paper that showed that that was actually the case. But what they forgot was that these ants, when you have a high density, they're constantly bumping into each other. So if you just take the whole trajectory, even of billiard balls bouncing off each other, then it's going to be more tortuous as density increases. But do the ants themselves change their behavior? Well, I removed the, the points at which they physically contacted other ants and looked at the, the, the turning rates, um, and there was no difference uh, as, as the, the density increased. So the ants aren't doing anything clever in respect to how they're manipulating their torture. <coughs> they basically have a simple algorithm which does change over time. You can see this at the start of the experiment and towards the end. They create a more linear trajectory over time, but it doesn't really matter what density they are. They just have a, a standard routine for doing that. But what I, I did find, however, was that the ants, when I looked at the exploration patterns of ants from small colonies, it looked very different to the behavior of ants from, from large colonies. These are just the first 10 ants to enter the arena. So there's no chemical laid down at this point. The ants somehow seem to know that they're from a large and a small colony and adapt their exploration strategy accordingly, such that they will be much braver um, when they're from large colonies. They'll just charge out there and have a good long exploration. And this is potentially adaptive because you know, when you're from a large colony, you can take more risks. There's more individuals that can sort of fill the gap. But there's potentially some interesting areas for, you know, for investigating these, these types of behaviors. And I'd be happy to, to give these data to anyone that's, that's interested. Um, but many of us are also interested in collective motion, other systems such as fish schools, bird flocks, and cellular swarms, and the types of collective motion exhibited by those groups. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work on locust hopper bands. And these are quite nice organisms. This is the time-lapse footage. And they hatch out, so they're a few millimeters long, and they dry themselves in the sun, well, under, under heat lamps in our lab. And very shortly after they hatch, <coughs> the individuals will start interacting with each other and start marching in a common direction. And they do this for several months before they get wings. And this is a really critical thing to understand, as I'll discuss more tomorrow. Now, when we deal with you know, these types of animal groups, you know, when we look at larger groups, we also see this type of collective motion. Does this mean that they're using the same algorithm? Does this mean they're doing it for the same reason? And I think that's often assumed in the literature, that they are doing it for the same reason and that it is the same model. Um, and so, returning to these locusts that we've studied in great detail, we were interested in actually trying to quantify um, the model that most people will be aware of, the Sirup, Barabashi, and Vishet model, which uh, in, initially we just used a one-dimensional version. We have a 2D picture here just, just so it shows the similarity. But here, in the one-dimensional model, individual's position is affected by the local average velocity of the other individuals, as you've seen in the, the, the first talk. There's some noise. And the difference from a magnetic-type model <coughs> is that they have a constant propulsion, a constant speed. Um, and we looked at how the density of the particles, this density phase transition that Vishak found, um, relates to the behavior in the theory of these theoretical models and in the behavior in the actual experiments. And we go from this gaseous life phase at low densities to intermittency, as Christian was discussing earlier, to this collective motion where they always go in one direction, randomly determined. It's clockwise here. It could have been anti-clockwise. And we found a remarkable similarity, actually, between this very simple theory and the bifurcation that you get within these real experiments. Each of these points, by the way, is the average of, of eight hours of tracking. And we're tracking five frames a second, so we're condensing a lot of information down to get each of these points, which is, which is, is, which is uh, an eight-hour experiment. Each, each point really is a day of work for the computer, more or less. Um, we can also look at the total time spent in the orbit phase in our real experiments, and as predicted by the V-Shed model, and also the total number of direction changes. A day of work for the locusts. <coughs> Pardon me, sorry? A day of work for the locusts. A day of work for the locusts. The, the, lo the, the locusts, unfortunately, very stupid. Um, and they, they just think they're marching in this continuum, continuum sort of condition, crossing this desert looking for food. And they'll march for 8, 10, 12 hours. They'll march for days without food looking for it.